Hello and welcome to the 204th edition of the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. In Nashville, Tennessee, I'm the professor, Matt Perkins. And a quick slant and go across the Harpeth River from me here in the Music City. It's our own offensive coordinator, the coach, Corey Burton. Well, you know who could use a few slant and goes here is the Pittsburgh Steelers. I'm watching the NFL, something of which we don't talk about much. But uh, this is uh, – I'm glad to be back with you guys. It was an epic weekend last weekend. It was an epic weekend last weekend, uh, most notably not just from the, because of the Purdue horn right here, but in fact because of the Alabama LSU game, which we'll get into in just a second, but we can't do that without the third amigo in the second city. A man who has a better decision-making process in his day-to-day life than any Pac-12 referee. It's our intrepid blogger from Big Ten and Counting, <laughs> Josh Cook. Well, you might have spoken too soon because a week after – Losing to Wisconsin, and this guy is dragging his girlfriend from California to the middle of Iowa for the Minnesota-Iowa game. The high is 43. Oh, 43 is pleasant football weather in, in November. <laughs> Not when you don't like football and it's your second game ever in person and you're from California. <laughs> well, it's the Bay Area. It's not like, it's not like she's from Palm Springs. <laughs> True. So anyway, um, it's been uh, about a fortnight since we last came to you. Uh, we had yeah, to, that's uh, that's on me to our listeners. We had a show all scheduled, and uh, I had a side splitting migraine, and just didn't work out. That's on me. I, that's I let, okay. It's I okay. let down the trio. It's okay. Uh, you went through the concussion protocol. Uh, you are now cleared. Uh, you, I did. You, you can I did. come out of the tent on the sidelines now. Yeah, Mark D'Antonio uh, checked me over. It's all good. Uh, well, it's better than other <laughs> doctors that Michigan State used to employ. <laughs> That's true. Although, uh, based yes, that on is what a Larry Nasser reference here on yeah, the podcast. Based on what uh, D'Antonio said and what his medical staff said, uh, there's some cross uh, communication issues there at Michigan State. Oh, good Lord. Well, let's start with last weekend, guys. We had two games for the ages. Let's start with, obviously, the one down in the SEC. Alabama, LSU, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. LSU ends up winning this one 47-42. Uh, but um, in the process, that, that, you know, that score doesn't even really justify uh, how dominant LSU looked throughout this game, Coach. Oh, no, it, it's, it was outstanding just how they controlled the game from start to finish. I mean, the, the run game was on point. They were getting after Tua. They were forcing Tua to make um, unforced errors, especially the uh, where Tua panicked and tried to run. And obviously he doesn't run very much, so he tried to tuck the ball and just squirt it out. And just, just uncharacteristic uh, fall-apart plays that you don't – typically see from Bama, um, LSU is able to put some of that mental pressure on Bama and make them uncomfortable all night long. And it was uh, it was really good to see because I've never seen Bama that uncomfortable for that long. And I thought they had a great game plan against Tua. I thought, again, their offense played phenomenally. They, they were balanced between run and pass. Joe Burrow was – uh, mixing up RPOs, dropbacks, things like that, and and those receivers really stepped up for him and really got separation and really found some found their way into some openings and and they protected Burrow for the most part and there you go, that's yeah. the recipe for success. Yeah, Josh, the follow up from this has been obviously with the latest iteration of the CFP rankings and uh, seemingly have Alabama at fifth yet they have yet to beat a team that is currently ranked. Uh, you know, and going forward, I mean, they've got Auburn left on their schedule, but it, it seems like the CFP is just giving them a way to get back into the final four, even if they really haven't proven that much so far this season. Yeah. Clemson and Alabama, real tough scheduling. I'm looking forward to the NIT with those two teams. <laughs> yeah. But um, well, putting that aside though, uh, Josh, what were your biggest takeaways from uh, the game last weekend in Tuscaloosa? Well, my biggest takeaway is a trend concern. Um, The last two times against big-time opponents with really, really good quarterbacks, Trevor Lawrence in the title game, and now Joe Burrow's against LSU, where's the vaunted 
Alabama defense is what's going to happen the third time that Bama goes up against a juggernaut like this. What happens the fourth and fifth time? It, you know, all all amazing, amazing things come to an end. And not saying that is happening because it's freaking Alabama and they can recruit like the best of them. But uh, it, it's a little dissettling if you're an Alabama fan, if you're an Alabama partisan, if we're looking for cracks in the foundation and wondering how are things going to end at Alabama? It seems like the, uh, the recipe is out, have amazing quarterback play. And even uh, their previous losses, Johnny Manziel, we thought, oh, a mobile quarterback, that, that's where they struggle. But Johnny Manziel passed pretty well in that game. So um, it's not an easy blueprint, but it seems like there might be a little bit of a blueprint now out on Alabama, and it's on this coaching staff and Nick Saban to readjust. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's one of those things where um, he has the, the trend, Josh, that you speak of, is that he just hasn't been able to stop those spread spread offenses. He just hasn't been able to find an answer to try to confuse um, elite quarterbacks, and and it's one of those concerning trends where um, has the game finally reached Nick Saban to the point where uh, have we found offenses that have been equalizers now to Alabama? And, and I think you're starting, I think that trend is starting to say yes. I'm not going to say that it is 100% a trend uh, just yet because I still think the sample size is too small on that. But I, I mean, I'm concerned about, you know, I'm concerned with uh, the way Alabama's playing and, and kind of the, the deal of, well, maybe. Maybe somebody else is about to take over. Maybe, maybe this is a changing of the guard in the West. Maybe, you know, maybe I'm being too quick with that. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, there's a whole lot of things going on. But we'll see kind of what, what Alabama does from here on out. We'll kind of see how this thing shakes out. Coach, any chance LSU suffers a letdown this weekend against Ole Miss in Oxford coming off of that big, big win? Uh, letdown... Um, by normal standards, no, but let down by their standards, yes. I think it's going to be a, I think it's going to be a closer game than they want. I think Ole Miss is. It's a. It's so, a so what you're saying is that you, you would bet on Ole Miss to cover the 21 and a half point spread. Yeah, it's an intense rivalry. Uh, the mag the uh, Magnolia battle. Or I forget the exact name of it, but they they play for this Magnolia Trophy, and uh, it, it's it's an intense rivalry. They. They truly hate each other, so they're going to get Ole Miss's best shot, that's for sure. Um, so they better come ready to play. But I, I think letdown as in are they going to lose type letdown, like an Oklahoma, Kansas State type letdown, I would be surprised if that happens. Um, but I won't be surprised if, if, it's, if it's tight for a while because this is, like I said, an intense rivalry. Josh, speaking of rivalries, uh probably uh, or one of it, one of my definite top three favorite trophies is on the line this weekend that is a large pig the floyd of rosedale um let's wind it back though a week first uh and give uh the deserved props to this minnesota golden gopher team who took on penn state uh last weekend and beat them 31 26 in what is uh you know, right now a career defining win for PJ Fleck and this golden gopher team. Yeah, it was. Um, I, I think the impressive thing for the, the win was this Tanner Morgan kid. He, you know, he's had some flashes in his career. Um, he's been efficient. He's limited interceptions. I said that a few weeks ago. Um, but I wouldn't say he was someone where you're like, he is a, you know, break the game open, totally dominate the game. And he did finally, and he did in a, against Penn state and he did in Minnesota's biggest game of the season. And one of Minnesota's biggest game uh, really of like the last decade to 20 years. And he didn't do it by hitting like, 40 passes and having like an absurd bonkers day. He did it by maintaining his efficiency, 18 of 20, 339 yards, three touchdowns, zero picks. 
It's like the quintessential Tanner Morgan day. And what impressed me, and it's a segue to what absolutely pisses every Iowa fan off known to man, which is what Minnesota did, and Tanner Morgan took advantage of it, was the Minnesota staff ran beautiful routes. They called excellent plays where the receivers were where Penn State wasn't. It was like the old Tony Gwynn quote that he hit them where they ain't. Is that That's Yogi what, Berra? Uh, I think Tony Gwynn said something similar to that also. But uh, Minnesota just found that Penn State struggled with secondary routes. They ran slant posts, slant you know outs, sluggos, like everything. And they were getting Penn State to bite on the slant constantly. And so every time Tanner Morgan dropped back, there was no Penn State player within five to 10 yards of at least one receiver. And so they took advantage of that. You juxtapose that with Iowa. They run just a horrible offense. They have no scheme that appears to work. They finally let uh, Stanley unleash when the game is pretty much over and they had a one play 73 yard nine second drive when they could have then tied the game but then it was the world's worst two-point conversion I've ever seen in my life Uh, but that is a different issue but that's what impressed me about Minnesota that's what impressed me about what the coaching staff did that is why I think there's a lot of envy in the Big Ten West for PJ Fleck and hey, sorry, Minnesota fans, but if Fleck wants to take the, uh, the Florida State job or something, I, uh, I will have no problems with that. He seems to be – But he just, re- he just signed a new contract last week. I know. That's why it's a pipe dream for an Iowa fan or a yeah. Wisconsin fan. With the huge let's, let's, buyout yeah. the next yeah. – Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, mean, what, that's why it's a pipe dream for fans to – of schools other than Minnesota to get the, the hell out of the coffee. You know, Josh, we, 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 we have to, especially me, I have to eat a lot of crow at this point because I have always believed that PJ Fleck is this, is um, all sizzle, no steak. He's this rah, yeah. rah kind of guy, but he can really coach. He can really coach. And it, you know, yeah. the proof is in the pudding at this point. And, and I can and use he all hires the right guys. He I hires mean, the right guys. Yeah. And, and, you know, they play as cohesive a set of football, a cohesive yeah. a style of football um, uh, that you need to play at this point. And it was, it was really wonderful uh, to watch. I, I, mean, I will, I will not eat crow. I, I thought he was a hell of a coach at Western Michigan. I thought there was some st- st- some steak there and not just sizzle. It's still a dumb slogan, and it's fair to make fun of the slogan, but it, I've always kind of admired him a little bit in terms of small high school kid, small college kid at Northern Illinois, overachieved making the NFL, overachieved in the NFL until some injuries derailed him, young person to join a coaching staff young head coach at western michigan young head coach at a power five school he's a continual overachiever um with a dumb slogan but (laughs) he's he's a hell of a coach he's an up-and-comer uh whether he's at minnesota for 30 years or you know moves on to uh, a bigger program or an nfl team down the line who knows but um i think he is a true uh, real deal that's going to be around here. Just an unfortunate thing that he has a stupid slogan and coaches at a rifle of our school. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that rivalry game this weekend, Josh, because, you know, uh, besides a big slab of bacon on the line, uh, Mm -hmm. there is also, you know, still a a big 10 West major implications here. If I was able to knock off Minnesota, that makes a battle for the ax, the de facto West title game. Um, You know, not to look ahead too too much, but, um, you know, uh, Iowa though. You don't, comes you don't this think game, you don't think Northwestern could give Minnesota a run? <laughs> if listen, if if Minnesota beats Iowa this weekend and then loses their un uh, their undefeated season to Northwestern, this particular Northwestern team, they will deserve all of the hate that we will be giving them on yep. that show. 
Yeah. Um, well, w- w- without a doubt. One of the other uh, things here, Josh, you know, your Hawkeyes are favored in this game, which I mean, I guess does, does and doesn't surprise me at the same time. Two and a half point home favorites. So it's not like I see three. I see I, the number I okay. saw was three, but still, either way, college home favorites still typically getting six at home. So, yeah. So basically, that's saying if it was in Minneapolis, Minnesota would be probably about a 10 point. They'd favor. be somewhere between was, seven and ten. Yeah, they'd, pro- was, they'd, they'd probably be like nine and a half. Yeah, and if it was at a neutral site, Gophers would also be favored. Uh, so I think that this Iowa team, the we know what they're they are. They have a phenomenal defense and an inept offense and an absolutely disgusting, dreadful, incompetent offensive coaching staff um so their max is pretty much 20 points um what it's going to come down to and it's really the same for all of iowa's remaining games minnesota if they're hungover and they start slow iowa's defense can shut them down Mm mm-hmm Iowa versus that's Illinois. It's it, the hangover out. Yeah. If Illinois is excited that they've clinched a bowl and kind of take their foot off the gas, Iowa's defense could shut them down. And if Nebraska is totally disinterested about being eliminated from a bowl, Iowa's defense could shut them down and the meager offensive output Iowa gets can turn those into wins. So this one is all about does Minnesota get up for another challenge? I think they do. It's a rivalry game. The win puts the championship for the division on like probably 95% because they would need to lose out. But this Northwestern team is, as you said, Matt, God awful. So I don't know why Minnesota wouldn't be motivated, but every now and then there can be a hangover. So I think this game is all about if the Gophers are goofy um that said yes i am still driving tomorrow after work and yes i will be in my long underwear enjoying the game and uh because i'm an idiot and i'm you know a sadist i want to do this to myself (laughs) well i appreciate that coach i mean how do you avoid if you're the gophers how do you avoid a letdown in this spot you just prepare like you've always prepared. You treat it like it's any other game. I mean, because I mean, like everyone is blowing smoke up their butt right now. Like the everyone is saying, "Oh, this is such a great story. Look at them." You know, they they had they like they are able to step into the limelight at, at this point. So, and, and and this is this is where the coaching staff is going to earn their money because they've got to uh, they've got to shield the team from all of that. Um, as Kirby Smart and Nick Saban say, "Rat poison." Um, or as Belichick says, ignore the noise. But um, th- there's there's gonna there's a lot said. They're they're gonna be reading their press clippings. But you know if 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 they really are the way I think they are, then they will just prepare like they always prepare. They'll play like they always play, and 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 they play a good clean brand of football, and, and they don't make a ton of mistakes. This is not the this is not the same Minnesota team that PJ Fleck inherited. He's he's his culture is starting to set in. And they're not Where's a culture. Your favorite word again, coach. Yeah, the, that C word. This is not the type of culture that takes any grant any game for granted and doesn't get too high, too low. I think they just kind of stayed at even keel. Um, I could be totally wrong, but that's just the impression that I get. There's one more thing working in Iowa's favor. So uh, this is Kirk Ferris's 21st season. Uh, they have three conference championships that they have the big 10 title game appearance so that means that there are 17 other seasons in which iowa has been eliminated from the title race and i'm positive without even looking that iowa's karma has to mean they're 17 and 0 in those games their first game out of being eliminated that's when they come out well, Josh, ready to go and another fun up. stat for this weekend <laughs> uh do you remember uh when the last time minnesota won in kinnick stadium was i believe it was 20 years ago 1999 during one of the dark days of uh Ference's first, first season yeah and that then, one in uh, ten team ten yeah i yes. believe they beat kent state golden flashes 
Well, coach, you coach, you talked about uh, Minnesota playing clean ball. They do. They are uh, accruing basically four penalties per game. They are they are, have been barely penalized at all this season. Um, so they have been playing some very very clean football. Although Iowa not far not far behind them. Um, they're only about three and a half per game. Uh, sorry, four and a half per game per. Uh, on the season so uh not sh- shouldn't be a lot of laundry on the field hopefully josh this weekend because i'm sure the refs would find a way to blow it <laughs> for both teams at the same time um yeah, so well i i you know i've got one more stat that i want to give you guys just to highlight the ineptitude of iowa football so iowa we are fourth in the country in red zone percentage 966 doesn't that sound impressive? Well, they've got 29 red zone attempts. Uh, the three teams ahead of them are at 49, 39, and 38. Uh, the teams behind them are at 41, 40, 38, 32, 32. They're, they're the lowest. Uh, rushing touchdowns, 10. That's the lowest, other than Purdue. Red zone passing touchdowns, that's, they're at seven. There's only two teams less than them. Run heavy Kansas State, run heavy Tulane, and sorry, a third one that I just now noticed, uh, triple option Navy. So that that's kind of a problem. They've got 11 field goals. So they're, they're 28 out of 29. Their total touchdowns are 17. The other teams ahead of them, LSU, 38 touchdowns. Georgia, 25 Virginia Tech, 26. And then the teams below them, Navy, 26. TCU, 24. This Iowa team is like seven touchdowns fewer. Their red zone stats are impressive in terms of percentage, but then a joke when you actually dissect them, and that just gets into the fact that, A, uh, Brian Ferentz can't get the team in the red zone, and, B, when he does, it generally ends in a field goal. Yeah, I mean, if 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 uh, eleven of your twenty eight red zone conversions are field goals, that's not yeah. probably a great sign. I'm gonna I'm gonna call out an Iowa uh, writer too. Um, so this is a deep cut, but Mark Morehouse, uh, uh, big Kirk Ferentz supporter, basically writes every excuse column possible for him. Uh, tweeted and in his write up of the game talked about how this one was on the defense. The defense didn't come through at the end of the game. Oh, in the a, Wisconsin were, game? Yeah. A, they were exhausted. B, the defense forced two turnovers, got the ball across the 50, six total points out of those two turnovers, shot the F up. Offense sucked again. One of nine on third down. Get out of here. Defense was not the issue. Defense gave up a career rushing day, yet still it was a bend but don't break. They only gave up 20-some points. Shut up. Yeah, and he and Taylor ran for 250 yards, but you know he didn't score. No, and almost all of it was in the second half when they were gassed. Yeah, the defense the, kept coming out after a three and out. Yeah, I I don't know how many three and outs there were in this game, but I mean just time of possession alone. I mean Wisconsin 37 and a half minutes to Iowa's 22 and a half. Yeah. Um, you know, just you know total plays, you know run. Um, you know, Wisconsin runs 71 plays, Iowa runs 51. Yeah, it's a joke. Get out of here. Get out of here, Brian Ferentz. Yeah, and here, it's... here's the last thing I'm going to say about this. Uh, Kirk wants his son to be the heir apparent. Oh, yeah. The, at, the athletic director is an absolute dipshit. The what Iowa honestly needs to do, they got to get rid of Gary Barr to the athletic director first, and then, like, I'm sorry, Kirk we know what you're going to do. You're going to hang around and force Iowa's hand and force Brian Ferentz. Uh, Kirk, you haven't evolved in 15 years. It's been like 14 seasons since your last Big Ten title, which, by the way, all three of his Big Ten titles have been co-titles. So it's been since the Hayden Fryer to have an outright, I'm sorry, clean house. I'm firing the athletic director. And then once I get a good athletic director in there, I'm dumping – the entire Ferentz operation. Let's just get rid of the entire school's administration while we're at it. Fine. The, the president, the, chancellor, the gone. Pre- I don't. I can't speak for the chancellor. The president is a like business background, non-academia dipshit. Get him out too. Jeez. 
Well, thanks for telling us. Uh, th th thanks for giving us to it, you know, sugarcoating it for us there, bud. Uh, I mean, you you can tell the school is there's a lot of incompetence going on at the school. Their their band got attacked at a game, and the school was like, "Oh, nothing happened." And then the band had to call them out on social media, and the school was like, "Oh, I guess we should investigate this." It's like, what are you doing? You're a school. Your number one priority is to protect and create a safe environment for your students. They can't even accomplish that. Get out of here with them. Why do I support this? I mean, why am I drive, to be fair. Why am I driving I mean, back to use my harder Josh, buddy in Iowa To be City? fair, have you listened to the trumpet section? I mean, it makes you, it gives you such a headache. Um, <laughs> Coach, let's jump over to another rivalry game. Uh, that involves your Georgia Bulldogs and the Auburn Tigers. Uh Auburn, I believe, uh, at least in terms of driving distance, closest SEC school to uh, to Georgia. That is correct. So and this, uh, this is a, also the Deep South's oldest rivalry, and not a lot of love lost between these two. Nope. Uh, so you know, uh, and obviously the players in this game know each other. You know, yeah. all these dudes grew up playing high school together. They mm -hmm. they all go to either you know Georgia, Auburn, Alabama maybe Florida, something like that. I mean, you know, there, there's so much familiarity and that familiarity definitely breeds contempt in this one. Mm -hmm. So what are you looking forward to this weekend? Uh, what am I not looking forward to? Uh, <laughs> I'll give you some, uh, some background information on this rivalry. Uh, Georgia leads the all-time series 59 to 56 and eight. They've tied eight times in this rivalry. Um, this game, uh, it's a revenge game in, in Jordan Air Stadium. Uh, obviously, Georgia won, uh, beat Auburn a year ago uh, in Sanford. But this is the last time they visited Jordan Air Stadium. They were 40 to 17 losers in what was an extremely ugly game um, that actually kick-started their national championship run. But um, let's see. Uh, the battle of the quarterbacks. Um, see kind of how Bo Nix does. This will probably be the best defense he faces all year. Yes, I'm even including LSU in that mix. Um, I, I think uh, we're going to see kind of what Georgia's offensive line is made up of. I, I'm interested to see how they approach the uh, Marlon Davidson, Derek Brown um, situation uh, on the defensive line, kind of how they take care of those guys. Um, I want to see kind of how Georgia attacks uh, this this Auburn defense. Do they do they attack the perimeter? Do they try to establish something uh, in the middle? Do they do they try to keep them honest, or do they let Auburn dictate uh, where they attack? And and if they do, that'll be uh, some trouble. Uh, Georgia's defense can they stop the run and force the game into a the hands? of a freshman who really has looked shaky a lot of the times this year. Um, so uh, that, that's a good plan defensively for, uh, for Georgia. Um, I'm excited to kind of just see Georgia clinch the division. Um, if they win, uh, they clinch the division uh, because uh, winner, if they win tomorrow, or not tomorrow, but if they win Saturday, uh, win, lose, or draw against Texas A&M, it does not matter. Um, they've got the SEC East locked up due to a tiebreaker. So um, a lot of things, man, a lot of things to look forward to. Um, and if you guys want to know anything in particular matchup wise, just, uh, you know, what I, I, I mean, obviously like the, the matchup that I'm going to be, the matchup that I'm obviously going to be just geared in on the whole game is one you just talked about Georgia offensive line versus Alabama defensive line. But what I actually really am, uh, probably could be one of the bigger deciding factors in this game is going to be Georgia's receiving core because they're pretty banged up right now. Uh, banged up, they're dropping balls. They just they can't. I don't know what it is. They're not they're not rookies anymore. Uh, they're nine games in, so the, the inexperience. You know, what's Cager's status for this weekend? Apparently he's he's a go. Okay, because he looked because he came off uh, the field last weekend not looking too hot. They 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 said uh, Kirby said he could have gone back in if they needed him, but they were up twenty twenty seven. Yeah, they were shutting him out. They they really didn't need him, so uh, they just let him rest. But no, he he's okay. Uh, apparently he clear he got cleared. He practiced actually. He was a full participant on Monday's practice. So 
Um, the center, Trey Hill, he's uh, he's also clear and, and and he's a go. So that'll be that'll be a good shot in the arm. Um, but yeah, so so you're excited, uh, Matt, about the uh, the battle up front. Yeah, of when course. George, what else? When do you Georgia expect? possess when Georgia possesses the football, uh, Josh. What what are you looking forward to in this game? Well, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, once Georgia gets up on them by so much, and the Boobers start coming down, and see Gus Malzahn squirm a little bit. How quickly he uh, goes from "I love Auburn" to not bearing the lead. Arkansas fired their coach. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we should get into that while we're in the SEC. Um, yes. Oh, is losing um, to Western Kentucky and being four at 18 or whatever it is not good for your job dude, security? Dude, they didn't lose to Western Kentucky. They got their ass handed to them. Oh, it was a, it was a final last second field goal by Western Kentucky. Oh, no, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. There, there was nothing – good at all about that situation and Chad Morris had to go uh you know I think the final score of that game was the old classic a lot to a little you know it's bad when you have like three games left and like doesn't his buyout go down significantly after December 1st December 1st his buyout you get like cut in half and they're like yeah screw it we're gonna fire you now Yeah, it's a really bad sign. And also on top, well, I mean, maybe they just want to get a, a, a jump uh, a jump ahead on the coaching carousel, but not a lot of people line enough to take that job at this point. Um, oh. And also we saw Chad Morris, man, like we've seen he left SMU and SMU finally got good. It was a questionable <laughs> hire to begin with. They leave SMU becomes a, you know, one of the um, best stories of this college football season, you know, in I, yeah. years. And now – you know, wh- where is he? I mean, he's not, he's going to have a tough time landing a, a, a coordinator position in Power Five. Probably. Well, well, if Arkansas stays true to form, maybe they hire another, uh, another scumbag and just go ahead and get Art Bryles. <laughs> oh, I was assuming that they were going to bring um, uh, Hugh Freeze back around. Mm. Oh, Freezes. Yep. <laughs> I don't know. Josh, wh- wh- who's on your short list for the, uh, for the Razorback gig? So those were comedic ones. Um, th- this one's decidedly not comedic. This is uh, not just for Arkansas, but just an observation in general. Um, have you guys seen Louisiana Tech this year, by the way? Josh, you took the name right out of my mouth. The, they're 8-1 and one and pretty good. And look, I know Skip Holtz was awful at South Florida. 16 and 21 sent to purgatory prior to that over 500 at Connecticut Mm -hmm. last year he was there won the division took them to the playoffs finished did you say Randy Etzel from Connecticut no I'm talking about Skip Holtz from Connecticut he was there in the early 90s then at East Carolina Purple Pirates turned them around took them to four straight bowl games won two conference titles obviously he was awful at south florida since then in his purgatory at louisiana tech he's won other than his first year when he first got there but other than that eight or nine wins every season but one bowl games every year and fyi in those bowl games if you care five and oh i mean dude can coach i don't know what happened at south florida but, uh, you know, if I'm looking for a proven winner, if I'm looking for someone who's succeeded in places that aren't traditional places to succeed, <laughs> Rutgers, um, you can certainly do worse than Skip Holtz. Speaking of Rutgers, um, they're at the one-yard line with Greg Schiano and they're reuniting. Somebody, no. somebody needs to hire Miami of Ohio coach. Did you see what they did last night in our Wednesday night action? <laughs> Good Lord. Um, uh, second, speaking of Rutgers, uh, have either of you guys seen what the line on the Ohio state Rutgers game is this weekend? Last time I heard about it, it was in the fifties. <laughs> yes, that is correct. It is 52. The line is 52 points for a conference game. Now for a, a, it might a, not be enough, Josh, oh since God. 1990, there have been two other instances of, uh, 
of teams in conference games being favored by 50 or more. Do you guys know either of those? Uh, Cumberland versus Georgia Tech. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Since 1990. I would, I would be inclined, based on some of the god-awful teams that the Big East fielded, coupled with some of the damn good teams Miami fa- fielded. There has to be like Miami uh, versus Temple. Yeah, that, that would be one that I would look at uh, for sure. Maybe – Back also when Boston College was in the Big East, maybe Temple versus one of those awful post Doug Flutie BC teams. No, gentlemen, uh, they are both in the Big Twelve. Actually, uh, Oklahoma over Baylor. Uh, o- Oklahoma favored by fifty-one over Baylor back Ooh. in two thousand and three. Oh, and yes, Baylor used to really suck. Nineteen ninety-five, <laughs> Nebraska, Iowa State. Uh, over uh, Florida in the national championship game? Yeah, no, no, they are uh, favored over over favored over Kansas. That was, Kansas? of course. Kansas. What is what, no what's Kansas ever been bad at football? <laughs> you know, ever since they got rid of the track, they've yeah. been really bad. Oh. So anyhow, um, I digress. Um, let's uh, though uh, continue on uh, this weekend. Guys. Are we not going to talk about the criminals and, and who they're hiring as uh, as their head coach? The criminals? Do we know who they're hiring as their head coach? Uh, well, let, let's talk about a couple of the uh, possibilities. Uh, okay. I know one of them. I know one of them, Matt. You and I discussed very briefly, and then the other one I, I sent in the group chat today. Um, let's talk about uh, old prime time. Yeah, and then Deion let's Sanders. talk. Come on, now. and then let's talk about let's talk about Odell Hagens, the current interim head coach, who is now three and zero. He was two and zero in a previous uh, interim stint, um, and he is one and zero in his current stint as interim head coach at Florida State football. Um, he got a ringing endorsement today from Mark Richt. Uh, Mark Richt said that Odell Hagens is Florida State football, and he's been around Ooh. through. Uh, the Bowden's golden years mentioned that he was uh, had a starring role in the Seminole rap. Um, <laughs> so he was in the golden age of Florida state football. He's been around Florida state football. I think he's been there most of his career. Um, I, to be honest with you at this point that may, and he may not be the long-term issue. I don't know. We don't know, but uh, Mark Rick made reference to uh, another school that hired an interim head coach that used to be their D-line coach and said he was doing okay now and that they should follow suit. Uh, he was hinting at LSU hiring some guy named Ed Orgeron from, mm. the, from the ranks of interim. So um, I, to be honest with you, I, I, he's got those guys respect. These guys play hard for him. He knows how to recruit. He, he, is, he is synonymous with – he is about as synonymous with uh, Florida State – as any any of their standouts, um, you know he he is. When you think of defensive linemen, if you don't think of Odell Hagens, you just don't know much about Florida State. Um, I mean, the guy's a stud, uh, and I think he should get it. As far as prime time, um, I mean, come on, that's a publicity stunt. I mean, he, he is. To, he, it would be a fun hire for sure. Um, I, I do think. I don't know. I. I think prime time out of all these publicity celebrity, like first time, you know, I, I think it, you know, you have a chance to hit a home run there. Um, Cause I think he would be good. I think he's very knowledgeable. I think he could. I, 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 I think that if you're getting prime time though, you better be getting some damn good seasoned coordinators with him. Yeah. I mean, you know, prime primes network is, is, pretty large so i i don't know i mean you know i, I don't know well, i don't you know i guess it, i just, just, just want to make just, a... just, just color me skeptical on this uh, as you know as someone who 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 enjoys the um both the athletic abilities and the mouth of well, you... deon sanders sorry what's that josh well i was gonna say if you want to make a splashy hire like deon sanders and you're at florida state all you need to do is hop on interstate senior citizen Take the AARP exit to Boca Raton, Florida, and nab yourself Lane Kiffin. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, talk seven, about a seven and three, five and one this year. 
I mean, listen, his teams produce, except for last year. Well, think weirder things have happened. Weirder things maybe, have happened. Maybe maybe Kiff Dog goes up to uh, maybe Kiff Dog becomes Kiff Hog. Huh? Ooh, huh? Huh? Mm-hmm. Huh? there's been some smoke there. Some yeah, smoke, some rumors. Yeah, yeah probably from smoke. something that he was inhaling. Um, mm. Well, uh, speaking of inhaling, they would never do that in, in in Waco, Texas. No, no, no. They are a good, wholesome Christian university. Mm-hmm, um, like Liberty. They are nine and zero and hosting eight and one Oklahoma they this rule. weekend. Get it. Two mm. there. Uh, eh, eh. I like that, coach. I like that. They rule. Um, well, they are uh, facing off against Oklahoma this weekend in what might be a preview of the Big 12 title game. Josh, uh, Baylor 9-0, and but that is about as weak a nine wins as you can find. Uh, probably, I mean, they have two – Good wins uh, against Iowa State and Kansas State. Um, aside from that, a lot of middle of the road to mediocre. I mean, you look at their yeah, non-conference. I, Stephen F. Austin, UT San Antonio, and Rice, please. I think if healthy, Baylor could make it an interesting game. But they've had a rash of injuries. I don't think they have the offensive firepower to hang in this one at all. And, you know – Unfortunately for Baylor fans out there, I would be surprised if this didn't end up getting away from them and being a four or five touchdown blowout. I just don't think they match up well with uh, with Oklahoma. I, I think you know, I, I think a team like Kansas State, obviously uh, because of the result, oh, Iowa um, State, obviously, yeah, Iowa State. I mean, they they provide a a tougher, uh, a more I guess a difficult matchup for the Sooners because because of the physicality. Um, I don't think Baylor is overly physical. They don't strike me that way. You know, may, maybe they show me something, but um, they score in bunches. But you know, again, anybody with a pulse, I don't know. I just think I just think Oklahoma is kind of that team that you know they go against a team similar to their style. Um, this game turns into a track meet. It it favors Oklahoma with guys like Jalen Hurts, C.D. Lamb, uh, Jadon Hazelwood, uh, and um, whoever else lines up at receiver for the Sooners. You know, I, I think it favors favors them because they can dictate the tempo. A team like Kansas State comes in, punches them in the mouth, and grinds the game to a halt. Was able to really dictate the tempo of it. And then they, uh, you know, then they started pulling away because they started physically wearing out Oklahoma. And, uh, you know, that's the deal there. Yeah, and, you know, the, the one thing that Baylor really can this year really hang their hat on is they have one of the strongest defenses in the conference. Now, I know it's the Big 12 where defense is canceled perennially, but they're in the top 15 in the country in yards per play. They're giving up less yards per play than Iowa is and less than than Auburn and Notre Dame and, uh, you know, all these other, you know, defenses that we talk so highly about, man. Baylor, like, you know, they're, they're doing a good job of even if they are giving up yards, they're only giving, you know, they're 31st in yards allowed this year. But, um, you know, they are – they're making teams really earn it. And I, I, I think that is one of the many reasons that they've been so successful. Yep. I mean, I, I agree there. I mean, it's – you know, that, that can be you – know, that could be a factor they could use in their favor. Um, you know, that's just something that they have to kind of, they have to kind of work and, and use Oklahoma's aggressiveness against them. Um, and they have to find a way again to punch Oklahoma in the mouth Mm -hmm. and it's going to come down to, and, and in this conference, really, it comes down to who can not only start to dictate the tempo of the game, but who can maintain that tempo and who can, you know, can Baylor force Oklahoma to try to play Baylor ball, um, 
you know, they, they have a distinct advantage. If Oklahoma can do the same, uh, you know, obviously they're going to win this game going away. So uh, because, you know, you throw all that talent out there and it just, it just kind of overwhelms them. Josh, you got anything to add here on this one? Uh, no, not really. So I'll talk about a team that's more interesting that we haven't talked about yet. But uh, how about those yeah. Illinois fighting Illini 27 points in the fourth quarter to steal the victory over the sinking Spartan ship? Illinois 6 and 4 going bowling. They have a bye week this week to prepare for the offensively inept Iowa Hawkeyes and then wrap up with the just overall in general inept Northwestern Wildcats. Uh, 8 and 4, not out of the picture. How about Lovey Smith? Uh, Big Ted has a tradition of looking for good storylines when the media votes for Coach of the Year. You couldn't get a much better storyline of. Losing to Eastern Michigan, losing to Nebraska, losing to Minnesota, losing to Michigan, sitting at two and four midway through the season and turning it around with that win over Wisconsin. If Illinois wins out, I think Lovey Smith would be the coach of the year winner. Uh, no, PJ Fleck. PJ Fleck's going to be the coach of the year. PJ Fleck is the PJ Fleck. You never know, though. The, the, the PJ the, Fleck is no PJ, PJ, PJ Fleck has gotten Minnesota to ten wins at but, minimum but what if, this year. But what if Minnesota loses out? They're not going to lose it. They're not losing to Northwestern. What if they lose twice to? Okay, if they lose to Iowa the and Wisconsin. They've still gone ten and two, and even then, um... Jim Trussell went fourteen and zero every season, <laughs> and could never crack the top five. They'd like give it to Pat Fitzgerald for going six and six. The the Big Ten. Yeah, but is, they they had so much grit, Josh. Yeah, the Big Ten can be really really goofy. I'm saying if they win out, you can't count out Lovey Smith because that's what the Big Ten does with their Coach of the Year award. It's, it's like impossible to predict who wins it. Well, guys, uh, one thing I want to uh, throw in here uh, before we. Uh, before we depart tonight, I, I went with the uh, the good old fashioned triple screen experience last Saturday. Mm. I had Wisconsin Iowa on the big TV. I had LSU Alabama mm. on one computer, and you know what I had on the other computer? Princeton Dartmouth from Yankee Ooh. Stadium. And let Ooh. me tell you, gentlemen, that was one of the most fun games I have watched in a long time. Obviously, um, the, the the Princeton Dartmouth game every year is a bit of a conflict for me. Dartmouth is my hometown. Princeton is a family school. I mean, uh, my grandfather, my great grandfather, my uh, my my mom's brother, my mom, my grandfather's brother, my great you know my great uncle, all Princeton alums. Um, but Dartmouth, you know, I, I for better or worse at this point, I bleed big green, being a uh, Hanoverian or Hanoverite or whatever we're supposed to be called. Um, this game in Yankee Stadium was so much fun to watch. It was a great atmosphere. Yankee Stadium, not completely full, but more full than for the Pinstripe Bowl, that's for sure. Um, and <laughs> Dartmouth got out to a 17 nothing lead and was able to hold on, win 27 to 10. And just looked absolutely fantastic. Dartmouth is one of the few teams that really, truly employs a two quarterback attack that is effective. Um, this one, though, they just they were keeping it on the ground. It was cold and windy in Yankee Stadium, so Dartmouth carried the ball 52 times for 225 yards. Um, but uh, a couple of those, though, were uh, a, a lot of the negative yards were knees at the end of the game. Uh, Dartmouth just looked fantastic. Jared Gerbino, who I feel like has been around since at least the first Clinton administration, uh, <laughs> I, he's about a seventh. The first year. one, yeah, uh, yeah, like the ninety-two to ninety-six. I guess it's one administration, two different uh, tenures. But um, Jared Gerbino, you know, he's just he's still a freight train man. Uh, I love watching that guy play. He's got uh, it's so cliche. He's got the heart of a champion, mm. uh, and he is going to you know you know, put his, uh, put his head down and uh, get the yards he needs to get on the ground. And, you know, just Dartmouth looks fantastic. Buddy Teven doing such a great job with this team. And they are on the cutting edge of football in a lot of ways that they use uh, AI and virtual reality and uh, these, you know, completely robotic tackling dummies to uh, reduce the amount of player injuries. And it's, you know, they were the first school to have a full-time 
uh, female coach. You know, they, you know, they've been doing a lot of things that go against the grain of traditional football, and I'm really glad to see that it's paying off in Hanover. For sure. So, uh, guys, any uh, anything to end here at the end of uh, end of our show? I, well, I got uh, I got three things, but they're a little bit longer, so I'll let Coach go first. Well, um, in, in this household, we're also excited for the Clemson Wake Forest matchup. Um, the seven and two Demon Deeks are thirty four point underdogs. I think is what if I saw that correctly. Um, the seven and two Demon Deeks are thirty four point underdogs. That's quite impressive. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a fun weekend of college football. That's for sure. Yeah, so the three things I wanted to talk about, uh, Indiana Hoosiers 7-2 and two in one poll, uh, just kind of hovering around there. They travel to Penn State, and you are curious what Penn State's mindset is going to be after their first loss. Uh, Penn State should win. Uh, Indiana's a little bit of a smoke and mirror team for those of us that follow the Big Ten, but it is an intriguing game for a better-than-expected Hoosiers team the other one uh we didn't talk about Notre Dame and Navy uh very intriguing game both teams are ranked Navy seven and one a big bounce back season seemed like we were wondering oh like has Niamata Lolo's system been found out or is being in a conference too much for them to handle uh no (laughs) just an aberration they're back what do you guys think of that game you know, I'm. I'll, I'll always be rooting for the Middies. No doubt. You know, I. I and, and Notre Dame. You know, has. You know, they're 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 doing okay, but I I feel like there's a at certain point they're going to just keep. Uh, you know, there's going to be more and more attrition, and I feel like they're. You know, they look last week good against last week against Duke, but I mean Navy for my money way better than Duke, so. Who knows? But I, I, I obviously be rooting for Navy, but still expect Notre Dame to win. Um, and one of the funny things I noticed about this game, though, is that it looks like the game is going to end the Notre Dame sellout streak. Well, yeah, I haven't seen a reason for why. I don't know why either, but like, why would you not go to this game? I know it's two, I mean, rank, it's two ranked teams. It's a rivalry. I know. I know. I know. All right, Josh, what else you got for us? The last thing, uh, long-time listeners of the show know that when we get to this stage, I always just run real quick. First time, give, long time. Yeah. Give the uh, – just kind of give the reset of where the division races are, the tiebreakers, the intriguing things to be looking for. So I wanted to run through that real quick. Feel free to chime in, you guys. Uh, American, Cincinnati's got the East on lockdown. They have a head-to-head tiebreaker and are two better in the loss column at 5-0 and versus 4-2 and and 3-2 and to UCF and Temple. I don't see how Cincy doesn't make it. The West is the intriguing race. SMU, Navy, and Memphis all at one loss in the loss column. Navy and SMU a little bit up because they are both 5-1. and uh, Where do you see that one shaking out? Ponies hang on, or like that Memphis team, or this Navy team. What's I, I I I like Memphis. All right, Coach. I'm with I'm with uh, Perko there. Yeah, I, like I can't. I, after what we saw, what happened between SMU and Memphis in that in, in, in that game, it's hard for me not to like Memphis and feel like you know maybe this was the end of the SMU magic. Fair enough. ACC is a goofy one. Clemson has already clinched it. They can't do anything to not win the Atlantic. <laughs> Uh, the coastal is very weird. Virginia is at five and two, but they are way ahead in terms of conference games played. Uh, Virginia Tech is three and two, and Pittsburgh, who's in action right now in trouble against North Carolina, is also three and two. Um, but Virginia seems like they've regained some of their footing. I, I think they prevail since they are pretty much done with their conference play. I don't know. I think Virginia Tech might have turned a corner. All right. Coach? So, uh, obviously, that game is going to – that that game for me is going to decide it. I'll be rooting for Virginia, but, uh, I, I, you know, it, it never shocks me if Virginia Tech wins. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, they, Virginia tech always finds some way to win that game, no matter how bad they are. And, um, I, I think, but you know, on the other hand, I, I think, I think Virginia is, I don't know. I just don't know how to see that game. I just, you know, part of me wants to say, well, that's just Virginia tech's game. And that's just kind of what they do. Um, well, just to give some details on it, Virginia has their bye week, and they've got Liberty. So Virginia only has one conference game left, the rivalry against Tech at home. Virginia Tech has three conference games, two on the road, um, one against this Pittsburgh team that's also kind of halfway decent. So um, Virginia Tech needs to win out uh, in order to do it. So a little bit harder path for an up-and-down erratic team. Um, All right, Josh, give us the next one. Yeah, the Big 12, uh, you have to love Oklahoma. They pretty much have it, it feels like, on lockdown, um, especially once they beat up this banged-up Baylor Bear team. That then makes it very interesting because projecting ahead, if Oklahoma wins, you'll have a 6-1 and one Baylor team. You have a 4-2 and two currently Texas team. Um I don't know. I think it's Oklahoma and I'm, I'm going to hedge my bets a little bit and say Texas. Uh, okay. Yeah. I mean, does it even matter? No, I think for pure excitement, we have to root for Iowa state at three well, and three we'll, we'll always to somehow, Iowa state. to like... somehow, to somehow get into the, cause they gave, that was a hell of a game. They lost on a two point conversion. State of Iowa, we don't do two point conversions very well. Nope. Um, the Big Ten, Ohio State sitting pretty in the yeah. face of uh, Penn State's loss. Uh, but the, nope, what, nope. But but if you know if Penn State beat, wins the Ohio State game, it's theirs. For the, I mean, they're going. That's that's the that's basically yeah. the title game in the division. Agreed. Um, yeah, it just seems like Ohio State's on another plane. Um, the West, it, it comes down to Minnesota and. Wisconsin, Iowa bowed but, out gracefully. But that's, only, but that's only if Iowa beats Minnesota this weekend. The battle for the Axe will mean nothing if I, if Minnesota's undefeated going into that game because Wisconsin lost to freaking Illinois. <laughs> Very true. Uh, Iowa, of course, bowed out gracefully. And by gracefully, I mean uh, ran the most confusing quarterback draw on And a, then a Chris Orr, who tackled Nate Stanley on that play, um, when asked if he was uh, worried about Nate Stanley basically running him over because Nate Stanley is 6'5", 250, and Chris Orr is small for a middle backer. He's about 5'11", 215. He said, Nate Stanley doesn't squat 600 pounds. And that was the entire answer. And, <laughs> man, listen, when he hit him, that pop, you could hear that pop yeah. through the broadcast when Chris Orr just planted him. And yeah. Stanley did not move an inch closer. No. Well, 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 once Orr got his pat, once Orr hit him with the pads, it was fantastic. I mean, that is how you stack a guy up. It doesn't defend the play call. No, uh, <laughs> but, but Josh, what do you expect from Brian Ferentz at this point? Like, do you expect? Did you expect anything better? Uh no. Um, Conference okay. USA. Whenever I do this segment, I feel like Conference USA is always the biggest cluster of what the hell is going on. So the East has. Western Kentucky at four and two, Marshall at four and one, and Florida Atlantic at five and one. Really, anybody's game still because Marshall beat Florida Atlantic. Uh, the West is at least a two team race Louisiana Tech and Southern Miss, although Louisiana Tech at five and zero, oh, Southern Miss four and one. The one loss for the Mustard Buzzards was Louisiana Tech. I, I think Louisiana Tech's going to. Hold on, they are really good this year. They're eight and one, five and zero in conference, unblemished at home, with that tiebreaker. Out of the East, I don't know, kind of a logjam. Western Kentucky, maybe after dominating I, Arkansas, maybe they're feeling good about things. Who knows? I don't know. I I have, I have literally zero feel in Conference USA. No one ever does, Coach. I have no idea. That's what we love about Conference USA. Uh, Maction is also been just all over the map for instance northern illinois is four and six on the season three and three in conference and yet still alive to win their division um other than the miami of ohio red hawks who have pushed their mark to five and one in conference uh several games clear of buffalo and ohio other than the red hawks 
the West is a mess right now. I guess maybe Western Michigan is leading it right now. Wraps it up. Who knows? I mean, yeah. again, at this point, it's it's so it's such a freaking toss up. I tell you, who's not getting it is Bowling Green or Akron. Or Akron. or Akron. Oh, oh, Akron. Yeah, my adopted team got back in the win column. They are five and five now. So yes, with that, uh, w- with that big victory um, yeah. on Wednesday night. Yeah, let's go Eastern. Uh, the Mountain West, which is always the opposite of Conference USA, in that it is an exciting logjam with some really exciting football games to be played. Uh, the West has San Diego state at four and two um, just ahead of the three and three Hawaii rainbow warriors and the Nevada wolf pack, but the mountain should be a dandy down the stretch because you have four or excuse me, five and oh Boise state ahead of four and one air force and ahead of four and one Utah state Boise has a tiebreaker against air force. They have to travel to the Logan, Utah here on the 23rd. So that could be really exciting, especially if Utah State upsets them. Then who knows where the Mountain West goes. Uh, Any vibes on this conference? Uh, It's definitely not going to Utah State, I'll tell you that much. Um, (laughs) Oh, Gary. um, I mean, come on. It's it's not going to Utah State. I mean, they are just not – they, they, you know, they, they, they're, they're four and what four and one in conference, but it is a, it is a smoke and mirrors four and five, one. five and four overall. Yeah. Five and four overall is much more indicative of who they are <laughs> as a team. They are a 500 team with a perennial 500 coach or worse, Gary Anderson. Ooh. Go home, Gary. Boise state though, not as strong as their record suggests. Mm. Um, I I still really like this Wyoming team, even though they lost to Boise last week. I think that Wyoming's defense is as good as anyone in the group of five. That's high praise. It, it um, is though, but I mean, San Diego I, State also boasted a pretty rock solid defense. Yeah, the, both of those teams have very very good yeah. defenses. Um, you, you know, you, you want to know something funny about the San Diego State team? Hmm. So, Qualcomm Stadium is just. It's a cavern. There's no reason it's, for them to it's play enormous. there. Yeah. Um, so San Diego State doesn't ever really have a good home atmosphere. Even, you know, if they have thirty thousand fans show up, that's you know that's good for a group of five team. But like, it looks like nothing there. They're two and two at home on the season. Road Warriors five and zero oh on the season. Nice. Yeah. Uh, nice. The Pac-12, uh, I'm going to save the North for a second because it's hilarious how it can play out. Uh, the South is Utah leading the way at 5-1, and one, USC 5-2, and two, uh, but a very erratic 5-2 and two since they're 6-4 and four overall. Your UCLA Bruins hanging oh, around what? at 4-2, and two, uh, despite the hiccup against USC, we all love Utah in the South and assuming they're going to prevail. Yes. Okay. Here's the funny thing about the North. Oregon is... Hold on. We assume they're going to prevail, Josh. We assume that they are going to prevail. But, you know, UCLA still has, uh, you know, their fate is in their own hands. If they beat Utah uh, this weekend, and, and, you know, obviously in Salt Lake, I doubt it's going to happen, but... I mean, UCLA has won three in a row. They've scored more than 30 in three straight games. You know, they're definitely starting to move the ball. And then they have – but if they're able to beat Utah and then beat USC, they close the season against Cal, who, despite winning last week and still has barely a semblance of an offense, there is still a path for UCLA to make the title game here. Well, speaking about paths to make the title game, this is where the Pac-12 is really funny. Oregon, six in the country, six and oh in the conference. Eight and one overall, you're thinking, yeah, they've beaten Stanford. They've beaten Washington. This division's wrapped up. It's not, my friends. Mm-hmm. If, if Oregon loses out and Oregon State wins out, the Beavers take the division. Uh, don't put money on it. That's not happening. No. 
but that was a funny bit of mathematics. Uh, Coach talked about the SEC a little bit. Georgia is very close to clinching it. Uh, They will clinch it this weekend if they prevail on the Plains. uh, Over in the West, LSU, huge, huge, huge win. Um, Obviously, they have the Auburn game left. However, with the head-to-head against Alabama, if they both wind up with one conference loss, the Tigers have to be feeling extremely good about things. Mm -hmm, Yeah. Yeah. And that leaves just the fun belt. Um, Appalachian state nationally ranked four in one. However, their upcoming game this week is against Georgia state. um, Who's three and two Georgia Southern. Georgia Southern is also three and two. And the one conference loss app has is to Georgia Southern. So, yeah, App is 8-1 and one and clearly the best team, but they haven't wrapped it up yet by far, um, especially if they stumble against the Georgia State Panther team. Uh, the West has the Ragin' Cajuns uh, ahead of Arkansas State and UL Monroe, although I feel pretty confident about the Ragin' Cajuns. They are 7-2, and two, gave App State – a little bit of some trouble. And on top of that, the Cajuns already have one of the tiebreakers blowing out Arkansas state on the road a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of the shuffling. That's what you're looking at over these next few gate few weeks. That's who you should keep in mind for these division races. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Josh. I think that is going to do it for us here this evening on the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. So on behalf of our own offensive coordinator here in Nashville, Tennessee, and our intrepid blogger from Big Ten and Counting, Josh Cook, up there in the Windy City, this is the Professor Nashville saying so long and see you next time on the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. Yeah, baby. Thanks for listening to the Illegal Motion College Football Podcast. To get in touch with the show, email us at illegalmotionpodcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at illegal underscore motion and check out our Facebook page.